such a a brutal world. Um, now, granted, league, you know, Championship and League One, League Two is not like that. But I think you know, you walk into a new job, any job in the world, it takes time to readjust. The game just changes all the time, and I think players are a a lot more intelligent than what they were nowadays because they have to be because of the way the games evolve. So, um, I think first and foremost, you've got to be tactically adept because if you don't get if you don't get results. Then you're not going to have any longevity anyway, and all the other facets that are important just bubbling away behind the scenes. But there are anything. I think you've got to try and not be afraid to develop the players, but to try things, try different formations, try new things on the pitch. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because it's the only way we'll learn. And um, that, 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 that would be a summary for me. I want to begin by going to the very beginning of your journey. How did football become a passion for you at a young age? Oh, do you know what? I'm going to drop my dad in it here. Um, probably like most people, really, grassroots football. I was playing in the back garden. I had an older brother, Mike, who's a couple of years older than me. And as you do, you tend to look up, you know, to your sibling. Uh, and he used to go to Cubs back then. Um, and they started a football team, and no one knew anything about football. And I still don't think my dad knows anything about football. I'm probably feeling a bit harsh on him there. But he was the one who was instigated with actually, you can be, you know, coach of the, of the Cubs team. So, I was very early, you know, started to kick a ball at two and three, and I was actually playing, yeah, for, for, for my brother's team a couple of years up at five years old. So uh, every Saturday morning, come rail, hail, shrine, you know, every condition I was playing with my dad managing the team, my mum wrapped up on the sideline. So that was the way it started, really. And how did that transition happen for you in terms of becoming involved within maybe the elite footballing process? Obviously, you mentioned your grassroots upbringing then. When was that moment for you when you realised actually I'm very talented and have an opportunity to maybe make a career within this? Um, I think probably the penny started to drop when I was about 11. We actually moved uh, away from Birmingham where, where we lived when I was 10 years old due to my dad's job. We moved up to, to Harrogate for a couple of years. And it was up there that Leeds United took a little bit of an interest in me. But my dad's job also brought us back down and we ended up moving to Starbridge and I signed for a grassroots team then called Forest Falcons and I had a league with Villa. So I had a trial at Villa. They wanted to sign me. But at the same time, the way it was back then, you know, you were, you'd sign associated schoolboy forms at 14 to 16. I didn't sign. So literally every half term holiday, I was trying, you know, Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, Villa, Nottingham Forest was one of those. Um, and in the end, much to my uh, dad's disgruntlement, I decided to become a professional footballer. So he wanted me to go to college, further my education. And I was like, listen, I've got a real opportunity to try and make something here. And at that time, I was one of the very few people who probably had some G decent GCSE results and had the, dare I say, intellect to, uh, to go to college. So I was the only one out of that apprentice cohort that went to college. But um, ultimately, 16, I left school and uh, went to Nottingham Forest and signed as an apprentice. And the journey began. Yeah, and in terms of that journey, 500 football league games. Just on reflection of maybe your career as a player, what what are the key lessons that you've learned, Steve, in terms of those experiences that have enabled you to maybe transfer some of that into your coaching practice and your coach education today? Is there anything that stands out? Well, well the game's changed an awful lot. Um, I mean, it, I, I look back now and I'm still friends with a lot of you know former teammates at a number of clubs and uh, to give an indication of how it changed, my first pre-match meal was staying kidney pie and chips at 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Yeah, and how life has changed. Uh, I could, there was no no nutrition, no sports science. There was none of that input at all. So um, I look back now and I, I wonder what would I have been if I'd have had all that guidance and, and everything else that went with it. But I think, you know, the players are like machines nowadays, aren't they? They're, they're like finely tuned athletes and the slightest thing goes wrong and they get injured and that wasn't the case in our day I think we were more robust but we were definitely less fit couldn't you know play at the intensity they do nowadays but I think probably you know there's a load of professional footballers that have a career in football but they drop out after two or three years and I think it takes an awful lot to have longevity and you have to know what your skills it is what you're good at what you can't do and I think a lot of people think that they can do certain things and they get surrounded by there is a poor network of people who, um, you know, make themselves feel bigger and better than what they actually are. And they get some bad advice and they end up falling out of the game. And I ended up, you know, moving around the country and, and making a large number of football league appearances because I knew what I could do and what I couldn't do. And a lot of managers and coaches would accept that and, and thankfully forged a career. 
do you think that's missed in, in a way? Obviously, there's a little bit more of awareness of dropout rates and and all those different aspects that you mentioned. You, you even relocation and kind of the mental side. The, you know, obviously, as football fans and football supporters and coaches, it's, it's kind of glamorised to some extent. But obviously, in terms of the football league, do you think that's missed in terms of the the uh, vulnerability of potential players and and kind of getting contracts and and having the opportunity to play? Yeah, uh, could be very limited in comparison to the top. You, what what are your thoughts on that as as a whole? I, I totally agree. I think you know to be a lower league footballer, you know everyone, you know friends, people, the other think, oh, football's great. You're a professional footballer, but you're on probably an average salary compared to most people in the country. You're not getting paid the greatest, and you know one of the issues I had probably post sort of twenty eight, twenty nine was that I was only ever on one year contracts, and literally what you know. You get paid from you know the moment the season starts until the last um, the last day in June, but there's a whole host of clubs that I played for. They wouldn't tell you until the season finished, until you were midway through May or at least early June. So one of the problems is you've got bills coming out, you know, left, right, and centre, paying mortgages, and you you don't know whether you need a new club, whether they're going to resign you, and they tell you in two weeks later your money stops. No, I don't know any other industry would let you get away with that. Um, but in terms of some of the other stuff, I, I think you really have to be mentally strong now because you're moving all over the country you've got to settle you may have to uproot your kids they're going to a different school you know your family your wife your partner it, all of those things just get missed out and and you think as a professional footballer you're in a club potentially training hours could be anything from you know stereotypically it could be from eight till three okay that's fine so you actually spend more time away from the club where you actually don't know the area you don't know your family can't come and see you, your friends don't come and see you. It, it, it takes a whole level of readjustment um, and it's not too bad you know if you're playing for a Premier League club and you you know I get people now play welfare offices who look for schools that take the wife shopping they do this do that you know you're playing at a League 1 League 2 club not cutting house chance you're getting that support in terms of obviously reflection of obviously your experience and what you just said then was it was there anyone that that kind of mentored you? Was there anyone that guided you during that process and, and some of the lessons learned that enabled you to maybe transfer that into, so obviously your, your profession now will kind of go on to what you do now, but just on reflection of your playing career, is, is there anything that, that stands out just on that? Um, I definitely didn't have a mentor. You know, I've still got some very, well, funny enough, three well, of my ex, not even Forest apprentices, who are we, we all went on to be professional footballers and moved away from Forest, but I still talk to them on a regular basis. So they've always been a good sounding board, but, the the thing the, the the penny dropped for me, um, and I've told this story before. I ended up signing for Plymouth Argyle. I'd had a couple of loan spells there. I signed under Kevin Hodges in the summer of I think it was not two thousand. I think it was, um, and we were touted around as a promotion, you know, aiming team uh, from from what he's now League Two. We didn't have the greatest of starts. We were in and out of the playoffs and probably fell away to eight all the night. Kevin Hodges got sacked. I signed a two year contract. Mark. Um, White had moved down with me uh, and Paul Stewart came in now within a week he pulled me into his office and he just said listen you're not my type of centre forward uh, I'm, I'm going to bring a couple in um, you can go uh, and I was just astounded you know this was like October time and I said well I've literally just moved my whole life down it's been three or four months and you're telling me I can go and he went yeah um, so that that was a tough one but it, it gets a little bit worse so the following week he was new into the club we had a, uh, the old fashioned first team versus reserves on the stadium pitch all the local media and press were invited I was in the reserves ended up as always happens in these games we ended up winning 3-2 I get hat trick uh, he calls me into his office so I thought brilliant I've changed his mind I'm back in the team in the squad you know happy days he pulled me in his office and he just said you've embarrassed me don't ever do that to me again he went don't, you're not allowed to turn off training anymore you can just rot for 18 months and pretty much that's what happened so I couldn't even go into training, never made a first team appearance uh, from there on in. And that was probably the hardest time in my life. And that was where I thought, well, what am I going to do? If football is not an avenue for me now, and you know, I've, I've got 10 years into it, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the mortgage? What's my next career? So from then on in, I just decided I need to prepare myself as best as possible. So as soon as I could, I went on the way for B with the PFA. And from that moment, every single year, I tried to, get as many different strings to the bow as it could so when my football career finished and I retired I'd be in a more employable position in terms of that experience did that experience maybe inspire you, inspire you to be 
a coach in terms of a better nature and kind of give something back to the game in a different way. Obviously, from from your, your playing career and obviously the experience that you've just mentioned was was that kind of the incentive of okay, I need to maybe do this and funnel my energy into this, but also prove a point in a way. Was, was that kind of the thinking there? I'm just intrigued on that. That that well, well you're right with both there. Um, definitely wanted to prove a point because I knew that I was good enough to be a professional footballer. I knew that I was good enough to to play in League Two standard, but as is football, you know, people have opinions and they, they come and go. So. I definitely wanted to prove a point to him, uh, and I think I did that, uh, you know, a, a longer term. But I, you know, I'm a big believer in you know treat people how you want to be treated yourself, and I think I've been the type of coach and coach developer that you know sometimes even in my position, I sometimes have to give some bad news, you know. But there's a nice way to do it. A, you can tell the truth and tell it in the right manner, but you don't have to be like Paul Story was to me and uh, I dare I say some of the glitches that came out of his mouth at the same time so uh, I'm a big believer in that treating people as you want to be treated So in terms of obviously you mentioned um, earlier that the game has changed since you played how do you think coaching has changed then from that experience of you enrolling onto the UEFA B licence and obviously being involved within the educational process um, during that transition for you from playing to, to kind of coming into coaching and the involvement of the game today. How do you think coaching has developed over time? Is there anything that stands out on reflection? Um, massively. I mean, I was really fortunate. I look back at some of the managers I had, particularly at Nottingham Forest. Uh, Brian Clough was my first year as an apprentice, and then we had Frank Clark, Ron Atkinson for a brief tenure, Dave Bassett, David Platt came in, Stuart Pearce had it for a few games. And I look back, you know, Frank Clark gave me my debut in the Premier League, and I love the guy and still speak to him. Um, but it was a very old-fashioned manager. You know, they'd come down training. Sometimes they'd still be in the suit. Uh, the coaches would take everything. It was pretty traditional back then. It was four-four-two. The only variation would be four-three-three. Um, it was you do it this way, and you're not even asking a question. Um, and the other days, if you weren't doing tactical elements in the game, it was pretty much you know small-sided games, five sides, bit of finishing, bit of possession. That was it. You never worked on any patterns or any shape or did any video analysis. You know, that just wasn't part and parcel of it. Where now I look at, you know, what the players had at their disposal, you know, the the, the money that's, you know, flushing around in the game. And it, it's gone to a whole new level now. Um, so I think coaching's come on, not even tenfold, it, it's just gone through the roof. And I think perhaps with the education now I think with the help of the internet people can see what's going on it's quite easy now to go and look at YouTube videos look at the top managers coaching there's various platforms where you can see certain things and you can be like my dad was back you know sort of 40 years ago you can start to learn and educate yourself and it's a hell of a lot easier I think it's not easier nowadays that's the wrong thing to say but you can educate yourself more just on that then so there's obviously that argument that you have to be a player to be a manager and there's obviously the, the kind of debate on whether that's right or wrong and you mentioned the accessibility to to education and coaching and there's so much out there that you can absorb. What, what are your thoughts on that in terms of that transition from, from player to manager and is, is, is it relevant or is it is there kind of key uh, lessons missed within that? I, I'm just intrigued on what you think on that as a concept and whether that's a myth or we can learn and absorb and be like Jose Mourinho and interpretator and apply that into, into other avenues later. I'm just I'm just interested in what you think about the, the value of, of playing the game and, and whether that's aligns with current practices at its best. Um, well, the short answer is no. I don't think you have to be a former player at all. Um, do I think it helps? Yeah, I think it gives you an advantage. Um, you know, you think of some of the best managers around you, like Mourinho, Klopp, Wenger, all former footballers and all former professional footballers, but they didn't have the stellar careers that a lot of other, you know, top class managers had. Um, but th there's an argument now exactly where players transition, some of the lads that I work with and some of the girls that I work with. All of a sudden you fall out of professional football and you transition pretty early. You're going back to the bottom rung, you know, bottom rung of the ladder where you can be a non-player or played grassroots or whatever level, all of a sudden you could have amassed 15, 20 years of experience through your 20s, through your 30s. So at the same time, you get a professional, professional footballer transitioning at, say, 35 years old quite crudely. You're way behind the non-player. 
absolutely way behind, you know, in terms of transferring that knowledge, understanding how to manage players, a group of people, session design, practice, leadership, all of these things that we talk about, they're miles away from it. Now, what they have got is in their own head, you know, uh, Jack Wilshire is a prime example. So I, I work with Jack fairly regularly and some of the information that he's got and that he possesses about the games that he played about, you know, Barcelona and Champions League and Premier League. It's all stored in his head. It's brilliant. Now, the challenge is for him to, to transfer that on the grass and to try and help those players. And that's not an easy process. And I think some of the some of the other coaches who haven't had the careers that he's had and haven't played professional football, a lot of them are, are ahead of people like that because they've just had the time and experience on the grass. In terms of that process, then, you mentioned, obviously, Jack Wilshire. Did, how was that for him in terms of applying maybe some of the lessons he's learned as a player into maybe his academy team. And I'm sure there's many examples. For example, my team, Birmingham City, Rooney's there at the moment. And obviously they have their standards of being at that elite club, playing with the best of the best. And then obviously they might not be working with players that might not be at that level yet, but they're trying to apply some of those values and those work ethic principles that they might have learned from other managers into their practice. How, how, how is that in terms of players using that information, that experience and applying it? Is it is it straightforward or is there obviously complex things there in terms of how learners learn differently and different stages of development? I'm just intrigued on that. Um, I, think, I think it's a challenge for everyone. You know, I don't think it's just for players like that. I think, you know, potentially what you may have when I first started to work with Jack, I was another coach who was obviously in place before him and they got used to his methods, his practices, the way he wants to work. And I don't think it matters if you're working in youth football or uh, senior football. You pretty quickly have to try and turn those around to the way you want to work and to get them to understand your values, and beliefs, your philosophy, the way you want to play the game. And obviously at first team level, you know, that's absolutely, you know, exaggerated because you've got to get a result in the next game. Now in youth development in academy football, rightly or wrongly, it's not about results, although some clubs will say it is. So you've got a longer period of time to to change the players' uh, current processes and methods that they're going through. But um, it's not an easy process at all. And I think that's where the challenge lies for people like that. It's they just expect, uh, and again, to use Jack, Jack as an example, he expects the players to train intensity and an intelligence what they had at Arsenal first team. Now, you're, you know, you're working with 16, 17, 18 year old players. They just haven't got it. And that's sometimes a frustration. Um, and at first team level, you want to go in, you want to get instant results. Sometimes you want to change the playing style overnight with a group of players who can't execute it. And then, you know, players, fans, media, everyone's jumping on the bandwagon like they are again. People sometimes don't know. It's impossible to change it overnight. It, it generally is. So um, it's not an easy process. At all. Do you think managers should be given time, time then in general? Obviously, of there's big pressures and in the Premier League and you see sackings. Um, not as frequent this year, by the way, but previously there's been sackings. Do you think there's there should be a minimum time frame then in terms of applying that philosophy and and adjusting kind of coaching practices? Obviously, you mentioned Wilshire, but I'm sure there's a range of different other people that you mentor. And how, how do you think that works in terms of that time frame? Because obviously, Rome wasn't built in a day. I'm just interested in what you think of that. Um, it'd be interesting to see it implemented, and it has been spoken about. Um... I can't ever see it coming in. I don't know how it would come in, but you're exactly right. You know, some managers and coaches that I've worked with over the past few years, you know, they look ahead and you're possibly working one, two, three transfer windows away. Um, now, if you're, you know, you're working at a club in the Premier League, dare I say someone like Chelsea, who last year had players on eight year contracts, you've got players on four, five, six year contracts. If you don't want those types of players, or they don't fit into your game style, or they don't buy into it, or they want to move on, you can't shift them because they're on X amount of pound per week and they'll just sit there and go, I'm not going. So, well, you can only have 25 in your Premier League squad. If you're in the Champions League, that's a different, it, it, it's such a, a brutal world. Um, now, granted, league, you know, Championship League 1, League 2 is not like that. But I think, you know, you walk into a new job, any job in the world, it takes time to readjust. You know, think about what I said about a former player. A manager's still got to relocate, still got to go through all those issues. Sometimes they're inheriting staff, so they've got to educate the current staff. Sometimes you're able to bring in one or two. But to take all that on board and to change everything, it's an absolute minefield. So I, I would be intrigued to see if that would come in in the future, but I don't think it would genuinely help because then managers and coaches wouldn't be so rushed to, to get instant results. 
So, so on that then, so you mentioned the different facets that a, a coach and a manager might have in terms of contracts, inheriting staff, etc. What things do you do then, Steve, to, to develop coaches in that way? Is there anything that stands out? Obviously, from an educational point of view, there might be an emphasis on technical and tactical knowledge, but you mentioned all those different social and psychological factors that uh, that might be apparent. What what do you do to approach maybe a coach that needs support within that? Is there anything that stands out in terms of you developing the manager and, and the coach within that area or is it down to them? I'm just interested on, on how you apply your practice that way. Um, first of all, it's about educating them. Sometimes they don't know. Um, you know, we use the phrase quite often, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and, you know, some some players who are going through their current coaching qualifications at the moment will most of them if not all of them you know if we had if i took you know a, a ua for a license course we run one for senior professional players men and women probably 90 percent of that course would have aspirations to become a senior head coach and manager now now that's fine statistically they're not all going to do that they understand that but they all want to do it yeah. um but to give you an indication of what that may believe you know our our job is to try and educate them and say well where do you think you're going to get your first job why do you think you're going to get your first job well, I'm a, you know, thinking about, like you said, it's like, well, I'm a former player. Well, that doesn't make one bit of difference. And it doesn't matter if you've got 15 former players going for the same job. Now, you may have your way for A licence or your pro licence, whatever it is. You both hang those on the table, so you're all on the level playing field. And then some of the education around the clubs, now some of them still think that they can go into a League 2, League 1 championship club. I, you know, can bring in five staff, six staff. What are you going to bring in? Them? Some of them are scratching it. I don't know. I never thought about it. Well, you need to think about it because, if, you know, that ever happens. And even going back right to the start, I, I never had an interview. You don't in football, you don't have an interview to, to sign for a club. You just, you know, player watch and coach managers watch you. Nowadays, you'd be watching video clips, scouts, reports, you sign. Now, my, I had my first job interview at 36 years old, but, and that was scared the living daylights out of me. So all of a sudden, all of these former players or non-players, particularly the players that I work with, um, and coaches transition, they have to go for an interview process. Now, we've actually done it. We set up a hypothetical interview process at St. George's Park. We had some former players come. We had current managers, some recruitment specialists, the FAHR. And let me tell you, it wasn't great because it was the first interview and we didn't expect them to be good. But what we were trying to educate them from, you can't turn up to an interview like that and perform like that because you'll just get laughed out of the building compared to someone else who's been coaching 15, 20 years. So, there's a number of different things we try and do to educate them. You know, interview preparation, upskilling them on on IT and, and general laptop skills because some of them don't possess that. Uh, media training, uh, being able to present in, to a board or for a job interview, and sometimes just un understanding the cultural landscape. So, you know, you you've played for a club. Uh, sorry, you you go and coach a manager club somewhere in the northeast. It's probably a hard working, uh, you know, sort of lower middle class sort of bracket if you go in there and you start playing a different style and saying certain things in the press and i can think of some managers this year who've said things against the grain of what the football football club is built on probably not going to last very long so we try and do an awful lot of things to be honest with you away from the grass you know we do obviously do the technical tactical work on the grass but we do a lot off the grass as well what would a manager's interview look like then steve what what, what is the process sir it's never the same uh, Quite simply, it's never the same. So we've had a number of different people come and tell us what their experiences were. Uh, I actually spoke to uh, a coach today who's had an informal chat with the club. Um, so it can be literally, let's have a conversation on the telephone first, through that's probably through a third party. It may be as then as informal, let's have a chat over coffee. Could be in a hotel, it could be in a coffee shop, could be in a service station. Um, it may be the polar opposite. You may be straight on the shortlist of three. You've got to go and present to a panel of 10 people in, in, a, in a boardroom or in a hotel where it's your philosophy, how you're going to evolve and change the squad, etc. There's no interview process that I know has ever been the same. And sometimes they're repeated. So you've got to go back. You've got to do it to the owner. Then you've got to go back to the, the leadership group from the players. It's, it's a real challenge to, to try and build coaches and, and educate them around this topic because... We don't know what the interview process is going to be at Club X. So if, they, if I get a phone call to say, right, I've got an interview there, I'm like, I've no idea what it will be like. So we just try and give them as rounded a perspective as, as they can possibly be. Now, and, and in terms of obviously the process of players going into those environments, and you said you know, players might be novice in that respect, and you mentioned your own experience. Um, 
obviously players might have social capital they might they'll have clearly economic capital from, from obviously where they've, they've they've played in their career and going into a, a kind of a job interview did do they under, underestimate the process or is there an arrogance to the process? So I'm just intrigued on what the players think going into that uh, that process as a whole because obviously they've got um, a persona and a, a kind of a, 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 a an opinion based on their playing career. Does that kind of help or benefit them going into to those conversations? I'm just interested on the overall outlook towards it. Um, I don't think... I don't think necessarily it helps them. No, their playing status and their pedigree as a player gives them a, a level of credibility. A- and rightly or wrongly, they've got a profile. So, you know, why do former players go into, you know, media and commentating? Because the former players and they've got a profile and people think, oh, they know what to talk about and they've played the game at that level. That's no different to, you know, going for an interview as a coach or a manager. And you're probably getting selected because, A, you're a, a decent, whatever that means, coach as it stands, but your playing profile will probably get those ahead of some other people rightly or wrongly. Now, I think some of them, like I said, they just underestimate the importance of that interview and what it looks like. So some people that I know of in the past sort of five, ten years, you know, have literally rocked up, no preparation, thinking, well, I'll just wing it. I know my stuff, I'm player X, I had a great playing career. And I've lost out on the jobs. And I think now you have to be prepared with as much detail as possible. Um, I know coaches and managers now they've gone in with the 90 day plan I've given it to every single member it's been printed out they've gone through the playing style what we're doing transfer window one, two, three we'll get rid of this player and you know I'm not saying that's got them the job either but the, the level of detail you have to go into now is, is fascinating for certain clubs but don't get me wrong sometimes it is an informal chat and a discussion and then it's like okay you've got the job so that still exists as well what are your thoughts on the current state of, the, of English coaches at the moment? Obviously, the, the Premier League has been peppered with um, foreign influence and his uh, opinion, from my personal opinion, I think it's bettered the game. But I'm intrigued on what you think on the current state of English managers coming through the system and obviously representing England or the English clubs at, at the top of um, the Premier League, the Championship, etc. Obviously, there's, there seems to be, and you'll know better than me, Steve, a bit more of a younger influence um, in terms of younger coaches in the championship and obviously that might have a knock-on effect into the Premier League um, currently but what, what are your thoughts on the, the whole landscape of, of uh, education from an English perspective at the moment? I, I, I genuinely think it's as good as it's ever been and I think it's improving and getting better all the time um, you know you're right we've got a whole host of young managers now who aren't naive enough I believe to think that you can just have a playing career and you can rock up on the pitch and, you know, you, you deliver a session. That's far from it. I think one of the things that that, that people struggle with in the early days is actually the, the, the effort and the time and the commitment to become a manager. You know, those playing days of rocking in at a certain time and finishing, that totally changes. All of a sudden, you work in 12-hour days and some people struggle, but some people absolutely love it and, and they'll, they'll do it forever. Um, someone you know, like Stephen Schumacher today who's, apparently going to get the Stoke job from and leave Plymouth. He was on our pro license a couple of years ago and he, and he was brilliant. Another prime example is Anthony Barry who was on the pro license and then Frank Lampard gave him the job at Chelsea. He's now working over in Munich with Thomas Tuchel. There's a whole heap of young managers out there that are absolutely brilliant. I think what we need to do is have success though in the Premier League. I think that's where the problem lies. Um, you know, unfortunately someone like, you know, Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard some of our best England players, John Terry, they've, they've never, well, John hasn't had the opportunity yet, but Frank and Steve have never really, it's probably it's really critical of me to say this because I've never been there, but there haven't been the success that I think everyone thought they would be in the Premier League, which I think is a travesty. Um, you know, Graham Potter, everyone was desperate for him to be a success at Chelsea because I think we need someone to win a trophy. Um, and then I think we may get a trend of clubs looking at it and thinking, oh, we have got good young English managers are either working in this country or overseas because there's a lot over there. And then I think the trend will change, but some of the, some of the people I work with are absolutely brilliant. They just need an opportunity. Now, sometimes it's a rub of the green. Sometimes it's, a, it's an owner who will give you a little bit more money. It's one of those things that's going to change the balance. I think. So do you think then the stereotype is changing to some extent in, in a way that, again, that kind of traditional English manager is very physical orientated long ball methods that have obviously worked in the Premier League many years back do you think that has changed then or always continuing to to change in terms of the perceptions of English managers and 
and kind of their their influence on football as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. We get, um, you know, at St. George's, we get a lot of, and uh, I'm fortunate to watch a lot of the development teams. So from the under-15s the under pretty much right the way through with the 21s, there's a lot of fixtures there. And, you know, it's been, you know, obviously well reported over the last five, six, seven, eight years how well we've done in those younger teams, winning various tournaments. And when we go and see them play Spain, France, Brazil, Argentina, their coaches are astounded at how A, good our players are, but B, what we do in terms of tactically on the pitch. And they're asking questions about this. Well, how do you coach them? What do you do? Now, across Europe, I wouldn't necessarily say the rest of the world because we don't play them too often. But a lot of Europe, I'm looking and wanting to come over to us, visiting clubs, seeing how we work because we are so dominant, you know, particularly at those age groups in, in international football. Now, under 21s, I went and won the European Championships in the summer, which again was was, was credit to Lee Carsey at the staff. And I think, as I said, countries and clubs across Europe are looking at us and thinking, well, what are you doing, particularly in your academies? So a lot of the coaches in the academies where they're doing a lot of the good work and you know bleeding these players through eventually go and play for England. So in terms of that, then, so you mentioned coaches, or well, we as as well, you as as an England um, employee, as well as me being an England fan, etc. That we want longevity, we want opportunities, we want um, to give English managers or English coaches their opportunity to kind of see the fruits of their labour within their practice. What do you think is important then in terms of skills and attributes to have longevity or have those experiences? Is there anything that you think stands out in terms of the qual- in terms of the quality of a coach that you think is is the key in- key ingredients to to be successful in that sense? Just a reflection of maybe the coaches that you work with. Is there any key element that you think is is relevant to to that and how that might be improvised in the future? Um, I think there have to be tactically adept um, now with some of the former players who, who've played at the highest level they've had experience of, of doing that and executing that as a player themselves so you know Jack playing under Arsene Wenger at Arsenal um, Lane Baines playing in the Premier League over 500 times under Koeman and Martinez and various other managers now had, they've had their experience as a player now I think what people like Jack and Lane are doing and other coaches like that are, are learning their trade away from the spotlight and the medium intrusion and the, the results business. And they're starting to understand how they can evolve and change teams during the game. Now, whether that's a result of a, of a result or a goal against or a goal for, they're now utilising various formations, understanding how to get those messages across to the players, make it simple for them to understand. You know, again, I allude back to the, the time as my player, it was a 4-4-2, that was it. The only change you'd make was a change in personnel, where now, even at under 18s, 16s, 14s, People are changing shapes at the drop of that. We had, uh, funny enough, Graham Potter was uh, in a name with us last week and uh, he was talking about how he was flipping from, I think it was a 4-3-3 three, three, to a 3-box three, 3 and the team he was up against at the time came up to him and just said, we didn't even realise. It was actually Steve Davis who was caretaker manager at Wolves and he was like, I didn't even realise you'd change until 10 minutes and then we were changing and then all of a sudden you changed again so we had to change something. And the game just changes all the time and I think players... Are a, a lot more intelligent than what they were nowadays because they have to be because of the way the games evolve. So, um, I think first and foremost you've got to be tactically adept because if you don't get if you don't get results, then you're not going to have any longevity anyway. And all the other facets that are, are important just bubbling away behind the scenes. But there are anything. Really. Do, do you think that will change and modify the game in a way? I know that sounds really silly for me to ask, but if you think, for example, the amount of substitutes that you're allowed and the, the in-play possession is a key emphasis of the Premier League at the moment. Do, do you think the game will change in a way? Again, it sounds really silly to, to say, but it sounds a little bit like an American model of kind of having pauses and changing shape and bringing different phases of play onto the pitch at a certain period. Do, do, do you think that might lean that way in the future? I'm just interested on, on how that might... Again, opinionated question. I <laughs> no, I, I would say I hope not because I think one of the... One of the good things about our game is its fluidity, its intensity, it's 100 mile an hour, it's end to end. And when you, watch, you know, when you watch a good game on TV or live, it's absolutely brilliant. And I think that's because of how fast paced it is. Now, the game is, yeah, even for what I played, it, it was crazy about that. You can you remember when you just kick the ball back to the goalkeeper and he could pick it up and he could, he could throw it out, you could kick it back and he could pick it up. You could do it 50 times in a game to waste time. Now, the introduction of that rule, the pass back rule, has changed it massively. 
But if we'd have said that back at the time, you'd have gone, nah, that's not going to happen. That's not going to be introduced. He's not going to be given the go at him for his chance to play. Now you've got the, the number of substitutes you've got, I think A, because of the number of squads, but B, you know, sort of what I mentioned before, the absolutely finely tuned athletes and the injuries because of the intensity, the distance, the covering, the high speed runs, excels, D cells, etc. They have to, but it, you know, you're playing 56 games plus in the championship if you do okay in competitions. That's incredible. So the brutality of that league, you've got to make changes. Uh, and I think the, the, the more substitutes on the bench allow for that. But I do think we'll get to a stage, heaven forbid, where it will become, like you said, Americanized. I, I think there may be specialist substitutes that will come on. You know, we've almost got them now with set piece specialists. You've got set piece coaches. I could see possibly timeouts coming in, I, I, heaven forbid, but it, it happens organically at the moment. You'll see a player chuck an injury down in the first half, halfway through, he's got a cramp, and set, all the players come to the dugout on the side of the pitch because he's getting treatment for two minutes. It's almost happening now. And I think with the way the ownership is changing with much more American owners, with you know, even the last TV deal recently, it's increased again. It'd be like, I, I just don't want to think about it, but it'd be like American football, you know, there's, there's a break for two minutes, there's an advert on, it comes back. And I hope we don't get to that stage, but there's more and more changes happening all the time, it seems to me. I'm interested on how coaches develop themselves in a role then, Steve. So obviously, for example, coming into the Christmas period, I think there's a game every three days in in, in the, the footballing pyramid. Um, Carabao Cup today, for example, uh, Premier League, you, you know, you know, you know what I mean in terms of the schedule. Um, how do coaches develop themselves, and in terms of their role, is there anything that you kind of advise coaches to do during the process of being in a certain position to develop themselves? Because obviously, it's fast paced, and they might not have an opportunity to maybe think critically around certain things because they're on to the next. Is there anything that you might advise a coach or a, or a manager to do to to ensure that they stay up to date and stay? You know, the best of their their abilities to perform and excel at their club. I th- I th- yes, I'll try. I, I think it's really difficult. Um, I think first and foremost, a number of experienced coaches and managers have said to me, "You've got to look after yourself first, and that's in terms of you know, physically and mentally. So yes, the days are ridiculously long, and you're absorbed in meetings, preparation, and training, analysis. But you need to create a window of opportunity to work out. You need to get some physical benefits because I think. The fitter you are, the more sharper you are. You make better cognitive decisions than when you're fatigued, you're tired, you, you've had a run down, you're sleeping in the hotel, you're travelling on a plane. That's when your decision starts to you know unravel a little bit. So physically, I think is important, and I think mentally, I think it's such a challenge to be on that um, merry-go-round of game, rest, game, match out plus one game. It, it, it's a nightmare, but sometimes you have to get off the hamster wheel. Um, and what we encourage a lot of coaches do and what we do with with certain individuals we take them to see different places well listen just come for a day here and watch these work and see if you pick up on anything the way they like, do things the way they talk to the players the way training is delivered that's a, a challenge in itself uh, and I think to go and visit sometimes other industries and organisations you know there's a lot of transference between uh, obviously other sports but yeah the teams like I'm you know, sorry in industries and organisations outside of sports you can learn a lot from so to give you an example we went to the to the Royal College of Music and we took a group of coaches to go and see them work and the A the artificial intelligence and the way that the uh, musicians train for the length of period of time they put them in front of a, uh, an animated audience they were putting boxes they didn't have to perform like an individual they have to do solo performers then they've got performers part of an orchestra or on, in front of the Royal family and trying to talk to the uh, specialists at the Royal College of Music who train those. I said, well, that's our job to get the performers a solo and part of a team to understand that and training and commitments. And there's so much transference the more you get out of there, but the brutality of football is, well, when do you do that? Because it's 46 weeks in the year. Then you've only got six weeks off. Probably you're going to try and get away with the family. And then you're just exhausted and then you're back. So as much as we would encourage it to go and observe, go on study trips, and that doesn't mean abroad or anywhere fancy. It just means go and watch someone work down at another club in your local area. But people haven't got the time to do it. Yeah. Is there a more openness towards looking at different industries and different ways of leadership and management? And again, it's interesting you say that. I was speaking to a rugby league coach who sort, well, I say coach, his, his role is within 
kind of the rehabilitation head injuries. And he said, there's a, a lot of people within football coming to check out rugby league, cope with certain assets or aspects within that. Is, is that is that something that's coming along more popular now in terms of that sharing and that community practice to develop people that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, the, the rugby thing, we go into Harlequins fairly regularly. We've got a good relationship and connection with them. And in football, you know, probably commonly known that footballers don't last too long in analysis meetings. They want to be short, punchy, 5, 10, 15 minutes max because players lose concentration and start thinking of other things. You go into a rugby meeting, players are going in with notebooks, they're taking notes, the meetings are lasting an hour and they are absolutely avidly looking and concentrating at what's being delivered to them. Now, why is that the case? Rugby can do it and football can't, but it's the same thing. Um, you know, the way they work out, the intensity they work out in the gym, now granted it's a different sport, sometimes don't quite see that at certain clubs but you're right in terms of the leadership the players look after themselves they, they police themselves they police the dressing room and football does do that in, in, in certain areas but it doesn't in others so I think there's a hell of a lot to be observed and, and learned from going into other sports absolutely and it's definitely now more welcoming because listen I'm not a rugby fan I don't really know much about rugby I could go in and watch the first team they could tell me all their secrets what's it going to matter to me I couldn't do anything with it anyway so it definitely is, and I think that would only help all sports go and develop and educate each other anyway. So just on, just on reflection of some of the coaches that you've worked with, you mentioned a few former players, but is there anyone that stands out in terms of someone that's really impressed you? Is, is there anyone that, on reflection of your time within the position you're in now, that's you've gone, wow, that, that's really made me think about the game differently or it's really stood out in terms of the practice they put on? Um, I think then. They've probably all impressed me in, in some sort of way, um, especially because you work with them over a period of time. You start to see the particularly strong attributes to their, to their coaching practices and their leadership skills. Um, I mean, currently with the international group, player to coach group that I work with, I think, you know, Jack Wilshire and Leighton Baines are, are in strong positions. They're being linked with first team head coach jobs. And I think that's, uh, you know, credit to them really that they've been you know I saw Lane was linked to the Plymouth job today and um, no, I did actually speak to Lane he said I don't know where that's coming from but you know him him being linked with certain jobs Jack was linked with the Colorado Rapids job not so long back I think because of the good work that they're doing and because what you get now is all the social media clubs now have got cameras following the story people all around the world can see what they're doing on the grass um, I think those two in particular from from the small group that I work with in particular I think will will go places I really do um, but constantly on the pro license we get a number of different coaches and managers that come through it and at some time across that course they absolutely wow you they really do um, and I'm unfortunate and privileged to be in that position but I think yeah those two in particular but I think it would be harsh for me to go through and name some of the others too <laughs> so did you embrace that experience then Steve did you kind of sit back and go well like I I am learning off these people from their experiences and is there, is there ever kind of disagreements and clashes in terms of maybe philosophies and outlook towards the game I bet that's something that you embrace really as a, as a developer to kind of absorb knowledge that way and make you challenge yourself in in, in a sense yeah. that absolutely it's every time I'm on a course or I'm working with people I'm learning all the time to give you an example we did something uh, on the pro license where we actually went um, over to I can't remember where it was, but we looked at the under-21 European Championships. I think it was in, uh, I think it was in Romania last year. And anyway, Ashley Cole was part, was part of the staff, and he was talking about uh, defending the foot, defending the wide player and attributes you've got to do. And all of a sudden, just as as off the cuff as anything, he went into detail about five minutes. I mean, man marked Ronaldo out the game when he was playing for against Portugal. But the level of detail he went into, and he started to get the you know, tactics board out, and he's moved. You know, he was like, I've got goosebumps now. It was just unbelievable. Anyone who was in that room, it was gold dust. Now, mm. you can't not learn from people like that when they talk. Um, so so it's brilliant. But to go back to what you said at the end, absolutely, there has to be harsh conversations at times because when you're talking about tactics and strategies, you're talking about people who potentially may work at the highest level. And they'll actually obviously went and worked with Frank at Chelsea and Everton. So ultimately, his job's on the line. So sometimes we've got to, you know, we can't, just say, oh, Ashley Cole, great. We've got sometimes you've got to give them some hard words and say, no, that's not good enough, or we don't think that will work, or well, we think you're wrong in this aspect. So we have to, because that's part of, you know, that's part and parcel of our job. So for those that might be listening or watching, 
this podcast, Steve, they might be inspired to 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 be a coach or they they have a, a dream and ambition to to really give the discipline of coaching the best of their ability and try and potentially um coach at the highest level. What advice would you give to them? Is there anything that stands out in terms of reflection of your time as a player as well as a developer that that is 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 vital to maybe share with listeners so they can be inspired? I think fundamentally it's gaining as many different experiences as you can. Um, you know, I think some of the best coaches that I've seen and worked with who, who haven't been former players, uh, I've been those that have coached a variety of ages and abilities. Now, that's a skill in itself. So if I could go in and coach a group of under sixes, coach a group of uh, women, a group under 16s, under nines, people with disabilities, if you can manage groups like that and you can put on a session and help develop those players, that's a sign of a good coach. Now, I think w- what we do get is some real specialist coaches who work with particular age groups, that, and that's brilliant. That you go and pick those up and drop them in an environment, and they'll be absolutely lost. So, I think gaining as many different experiences as you can with different age groups, different abilities, and I think don't be afraid to try things. Now, if you're working in development football, and it's not results, but you know, I saw something break with yesterday about the under eights stuff on social media. A parent wrote criticising the coach at under eight I'm like come on it's just about the kids having a kick around and I'm going to be a son at that age but I think you've got to try and not be afraid to develop the players but to, to try things try different formations try new things on the pitch don't be afraid to make mistakes because it's the only way we'll learn um, that, 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 that would be a summary for me very quickly. very quickly and just on that then and we're kind of coming into the final phase of our conversation what do you think the future of coaching will look like then you mentioned obviously the different age groups and we spoke earlier around the different potential roles that might be apparent substitute coach throwing coaches as well have become popular at the moment where, where do you think the the industry will go within football or, or maybe uh, other sports as well around coaching practice is there anything that stands out in terms of its advancement and in its improvement in the future and um, i definitely think it will become more academic uh, i definitely think that i think a lot of coaches and, and managers will, will say certain things, discuss certain things, but what you've got now is, particularly in academies from the 21 stand, you've got a whole host of academics that have gone to the university, got a master's in coaching. I think now come in and actually have the, the knowledge to back up their discussions or not and, and to challenge some of these coaches. So I think we'll get a lot more coaches that will come out meet the, the world of academia. And I think hopefully what we may get is people challenging themselves and going abroad you know i think we've got i think it's something like 3300 jobs you know part-time and full-time in the academies across this country but i think there's more and more coaches that are showing an ability and a bravery to go and coach abroad and give it a go um, steve bold's a prime example at the moment he's working in uh Lommel in belgium or uh, mark jackson who's currently on that pro license he's just gone out to australia uh, i think we'll get more people like that you know players do it you know players now are going to play in different countries where 10 years ago it, it wasn't the norm at all I think coaches and managers do that and I think it will only help me in this game I really do in, obviously the advancement of the women's game and even Saudi Arabia there could be even more expansion there in terms of that yeah well well it's like everything else I think Matt wants to keep an eye on because if they are going to get the World Cup which it seems as though they will do which is you know just over 10 years away or whatever that's wherever that is they're just going to grow like an absolute juggernaut so um, you know, there's a whole host of coaches in the Far East now, and I think South America will become. I think you'll just you'll just become a global business where coaches will be picked up, dropped off. Uh, you know, I think you know, look at someone like Manchester City and City Football Group, and they've got their clubs that are positioned all around the world. They're so far ahead in terms of the volume of clubs that they've got, and they can just move coaches wherever they want. And I think that's what we'll potentially see: a coach may be in South 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 America one season, the next season he may be in Europe, the next season he may be in Africa. I think that's the way it will go. Interesting. So we'll kind of keep an eye on that in terms of how that develops. Uh, again, it's an interesting concept to think how global the actual game is going, and especially around coach education and the advancement within that. My, my final question to you then, Steve, is just obviously in terms of what we've spoke about today over the last 50 minutes is a bit of a personal one, and it's how would you like to be remembered in the in the area of coaching? Ooh, um <laughs> genuinely just someone that tried his best to help people and uh, I always I've always thought when I'm retired whatever age that is and I'm an old man if I'm walking down the street and I've 
and I walk past someone that I've coached, I'd love them just to come over and just say, hi, how are you? You know, thanks for helping me and trying to improve me. I think that's it. I think that's what I'd like to remember by just someone who did the best to try and help people. Um, I'm a people person. I love being around. I love trying to help people in whatever format that may be. So I think that's probably it. Yeah, no delusions of grandeur or anything like that. Just a good people person that tries to help. Excellent. Well, we'll finish there, Steve. I just want to say thank you for your for your time and your insight, obviously, in terms of your values and your expression to help people and develop individuals, whether that's on in, in coaching, whether that's maybe in academia, whether that's just developing maybe the whole footballing uh, industry uh, is very impressive. And I just want to wish you well in terms of your future plans and good luck with, with your current plans as well. Um, but more importantly, thank you for this conversation and uh, speak soon. No problem. Thank you, Christy.